All right, welcome to the Friday edition of Talk Back, brought to you by the Mustard Seed Asian Cafe at Southgate Mall, Kootenai Creek Village. They're the maintenance-free active adult community in Stevensville. Dig it excavating, where they bring 30 years of excellence to every job. Visit digitmontana.com. Also brought to you by Transport Equipment, your headquarters for RV service maintenance and repair, located next to the Axeman, 541-9097. All right, welcome everybody. Friday, Friday, Friday. John King's over there. Hey, good morning. How you doing, man? I am pretty good. I'm yeah. happy it's Friday. Yeah, I, I, uh, <laughs> you played me something this morning. It just, <laughs> just made me bust a gut. Uh, I have to play. I, I wanted to play this for you because, right? You know, we're very human behind the microphone. Oh yeah, and you uh, no doubt have noticed that, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize just how live live news can be oh yeah until you've had a mistake oh yeah well i found been, this been clip. there been there done that <laughs> okay. peter's promised to tell me a story which yes. he hasn't until after I, this segment yeah, after the segment yeah um so there's this uh and this after the kids are in bed <laughs> <laughs> okay but go ahead oh boy right. um so there's this uh clip of New Zealand. Now, this is television, but it makes right. just as much sense sure, on the radio. because it's still live, right. You can't see the lady crying, but <laughs> uh, the, the, if, you, if you want to pull the clip up, uh, the yeah, name yeah. of the anchor here is Hillary Berry. And it is um, New Zealand news, yes. so when they say the word two, it sounds like the word toe, right. et cetera, right. but <laughs> I think you'll get the I gist. Love the, I love the way they talk, though. <laughs> All right, you ready? Yeah, Okay, ladies it. and gentlemen, turn up your radios. Because I guarantee you, you will be on the floor in just a, just a moment. Stand by. Here we go. Mohammed Rizalman will be sentenced today at the High Court in Wellington on an indecent assault charge. Rizalman pleaded guilty, but there were still disputed facts over why he followed Tanya Billingsley home. Emily Cooper reports. Mohammad Rizalman once had an untainted, two-decade-long career in the Malaysian military. Today, he'll be sentenced for indecent assault. In November, he admitted following then-21-year-old Tanya Billingsley home. He said he'd had an emergency defecation situation and needed to use her bathroom, but the judge in the case found he had a sexual motive. <laughs> an emergency <laughs> Situation. <laughs> How would you describe it? Eh? Anyway, carry on, Hillary. <laughs> yeah, just I as think you I'm want. having one myself. <laughs> okay, now this is where it gets good. Here we go. Because this next story is so tragic, I cannot be laughing. Right. Investigators believe a bomb caused the explosion on a plane which has just taken off from the Somali capital of Mogadishu. The blast blew a hole in the side of the plane and one of the 74 passengers on board was sucked out, which is terrible. And I'm not laughing at that. Oh As the plane was at relatively low altitude, there was no violent decompression and it held together. No one has no responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> Today could be the day I lose my job. <laughs> okay, so so there you go. This is live. It was live TV. Okay, no curse words, mind you, except if you consider an emergency defecation situation would be. Well, I don't know. They were speaking in New Zealand. Who yeah, knows what yeah, they said? I know, I know. But okay, so that brings me to a story that I must share. This happened a long time ago. I even worked for another radio station here in town, and my good friend, Bill Schwanke, former voice of the Grizz, Bill Schwanke, he was doing the news with me that day, okay? And uh, in that time, this this is long before computers, long before automation, and all that, everything was absolutely live. So what Bill would do is he would do national news, and he had uh, we had these little carts that looked like little eight-track tapes, and he would record news cuts onto the carts, right? And uh, one of them was, uh, it was a story about Congressman Wayne Hayes. Now, you're way too young to remember this. But Congressman Wayne Hayes was caught in this horrible sex scandal, all right? And uh, uh, his, quote, secretary, um, uh, well, anyway, uh, th they asked the secretary, uh, she, she testified before Congress, all this sort of thing, and uh, they asked this, this gal who was, Absolutely beautiful, blonde bombshell type, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think her name was, yes, her name was Elizabeth Ray. Okay, okay. Elizabeth Ray and Wayne Hayes. And they asked her, 
And, of course, remember, Bill and I are doing this live. So he's reading the script. He says, and they, they asked Elizabeth Ray what could be done to keep this kind of thing from happening again. And she said, and this is a quote I will never forget. She said, and I quote, Well, I think it's very important that everyone have to take a civil cervix exam. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, Schwanky and I, we both absolutely. So we're right, we're right, right in the middle. We haven't even got the local news yet. Okay, we're right in the middle of the newscast, and we're both laughing so hard. It was so incredibly immature, I know, but we couldn't stop. So we just played a long stop set and got out of it. And uh, luckily, I still have a job in radio. Anyway, that's so that that's what happened to me. That's that's my story. You're not the only I'm one making uh, making <laughs> mistakes on the radio. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when it comes to advertising, right? The cruise campaign is getting a little bit of um, getting its fill. Okay, I guess you could say. All right. Uh, after they have an ad out, and it's it says trusted, right? Right. But the trust is in blue, and the Ted is in red, right? Right. Well, some people are like, "What is a trust?" <laughs> Trust Ted? <laughs> Trust Ted. Well, it turns out T R U S is a transrectal ultrasound. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. So if you want to take them at their word, I guess that would be uh a uh, sweet, sweet vengeance, perhaps. To and remember, Ben Carson's a doctor, so he could do that. <laughs> He's not a very good doctor, according to Donald. But <laughs> he's a brain surgeon. I'm sure he could sure figure he knows out how trans, to run a truss. Transrectal uh, <laughs> exam. Ultrasound. Ultrasound. Okay, so uh, now that we've ruined this per this perfectly good segment, we'll we'll take and come back and talk about some other stuff. <laughs> But yeah. I thought you might enjoy a little chuckle. If you missed the debates last night, they got pretty heated, and yeah. I have some of now the most fiery exchanges. For, for, from for that folks debate. who don't who don't know what we're talking about, they actually this is the very first one on one debate between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. You know, w- without uh, the other fellow who was uh, Mart- Martin O'Malley, who yes. was dropped out of the race, so it was just the two of them battling hammer and tongs. Well, and actually, so. this is one of those debates that wasn't supposed to be. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. The Democratic committee allowed it um, late in the game. So was there a winner and a loser? I'm sure there there uh, always is in someone's anyway. mind, right? Okay. Well, we're going to take a break. 721-1290. It's open phones until 9, and we're expecting John Kappas uh, from Mountain Water Company to be with us from 9 to 10. Lots going on there. I have lots of lots of questions I want to ask there. So anyway, like, what's what's next with all the stuff that's been going on? Your with trusted source in news exactly. and talk radio. Trust Ted. We'll be right back. Ow, yeah. Come on, baby. Ow. I'm just uh, <clears throat> stalling because John's out of the room. <laughs> All right, we're back. 7 to 1, 12, 9. I've, al- I've already been told uh-huh. that we need to settle down in here. Oh, really? Yes. I, one, of our, one of my most trusted friends at the radio station looked at me, very serious look, said, yeah, you guys need to settle down in there. I noticed you said trusted friend. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, fine. That was unintentional. Wasn't I know it, it was just totally. Oh, yeah, totally. I can't yeah, help yeah. myself. Yeah. Anyway, all, all right. right. <laughs> so aside from that, <laughs> I'm sure we'll we'll definitely take that advice to heart eventually. Okay, so uh, we we have. Uh, gosh, this is three minutes long. Yeah, so. it's a, it's a bit. It's actually a couple clips combined. Okay, um, it's kind of they're a, not too far away from each right. other in the debate, but this is where things got uh, to their most. Um, volcanic, I guess okay. you could say. Yeah, here we go. There is this attack that he is putting forth, which really comes down to, you know, anybody who ever took donations or speaking fees from any interest group uh, has to be bought. And I just absolutely reject that, Senator. And I really don't think these kinds of attacks by insinuation are worthy of you. And enough is enough. If you've got something to say, say it directly. 
but you will not find that I ever changed a view or a vote because of any donation that I ever received. What? And I have stood up and I have represented my constituents to the best of my ability, and I'm very proud of that. You know, so I think it's time to end the very artful smear that you and your campaign oh, have been carrying oh, out oh, in recent oh, weeks. Oh, and let's talk Finance reform. Let's talk I, about it. I worked hard for McCain Feingold. I want to reverse Citizens let's, United. Let's, let's talk about so, issues. Let's, let's talk, talk about issues. Let's talk about it. There is a reason. You know, there is a reason why these people are putting huge amounts of money into our political system. And in my view, it is undermining American democracy and it is allowing. Congress to represent wealthy campaign contributors and not the working families of this country. Well, you know, Senator, I don't think. I don't think. I don't think you could find any person in political life today who has been subjected to more attacks and had more money spent against her by special interests, among whom you have named a few, than I. And I'm proud of that. You know, when I took on the drug companies and the insurance companies for universal health care coverage, they went after me with a vengeance. Today, you've got hedge fund billionaires aligned with Karl Rove running ads against me to try to get Democrats to vote for you. I know this game. I'm going to stop this game. But while we're talking about votes, you're the one who voted to deregulate swaps and derivatives in 2000, which contributed to the over-leveraging of Lehman Brothers, which was one of the culprits that brought down the economy. So I don't know. I don't, I'm not impugning your motive because you voted to deregulate swaps and derivatives. People make mistakes, and I'm no. certainly not saying you right. did it for any right. kind of financial advantage. What, what we've got you to do as think. Democrats, what we've got to do as Democrats is to be united to actually solve these problems and what I believe is that I have a better track record and a better opportunity to actually get that job done. That's well, what this election should be about. Well, besides, it's my turn. All right. It's my so, turn, doggone it. Later, yeah. I don't have the clip or we're not going to play it anyway. Okay, so right, right. Yeah, yesterday, there was a little bit of a forum, right, in New right. Hampshire. And Hillary said um, <clears throat> that she didn't plan on running for president when she gave those $200,000 speeches for Goldman Sachs and oh. some of the other big banks, oh, okay. right? right? She hadn't, she hadn't even thought, it hadn't even occurred to her to run for <laughs> president. Just because she, she failed yeah, four, yeah, eight, yeah. eight years ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, what happened right after that, right, is during last night's debate, they're like, well, what did you actually t speak to the banks about when you did those, those speeches? <laughs> Oh, I told them about how I was going to come and break them up, and they paid me $200,000 for it. Oh, I bet that's right. Well, can you release the transcripts of those speeches? And she said she would look into it. Uh huh. So now it's kind of a waiting game on whether or not she releases this. Well, I, they, they, but they may be part, they may be buried in some of those emails. She's like, that... I would love to, but they're considered classified <laughs> in my email system. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> anyway, all right. We have a caller on the line. Go ahead and put those headphones on, John, so you can take part in the conversation here. Even though you're not scheduled till 9, we love having you in the studio. Okay. Uh, Mark, you're on TalkBack. Hi. Thanks for holding. What's on your mind? Oh, it's about the Lady Grizz uh, last night. Yeah, it was a remarkable now game. They, they, they finally they had a lot of four-game losing streak, and they really uh, performed well last night. Yeah, they did not want to be on the wrong side of history by making a five which would have been Robin's first right. five-game losing streak. Right. So, in that last segment about Hillary and uh, Bernie. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, I'm sure that Macaulay Fowler is really feeling the burning, you know, of the ankle sprain. Usually she stays outside, you know, because she's a three-point expert. Uh-huh. Sort of like Stephen Curry. Uh -huh. and But she was crashing the boards, you know, because they need the rebounds. That's how she got hurt, you know, coming down on someone's foot. Sure. So I'd like to give a shout out to her, you know. You got going, it. You know, going more than 100%, so they could uphold Robbins, you know, not, not losing more than four games. Well, good job, Mark. Thanks thanks for the update. We appreciate it. All right. Uh, Catherine, you're on TalkBack. Hi. Hi. Well, about the that uh, Hillary's little points about um, fees and all that, 
she uh, got paid six hundred and seventy-five thousand uh, dollars giving a speech to Goldman Sachs. Mm-hmm. Uh, Anderson Cooper uh, in a CNN t- town hall got uh, kind of dinged her about that. At, this is right after she was railing about Wall Street, <laughs> and um, so. Me thinks thou dost protest too much, yes. Yeah, and so he said, well, what about that $675,000 speaking fee to Goldman Sachs? Well, you know, they offered it. Yes, well, that's what they offered. (laughs) Actually, I think I have that clip in here. Oh, do you? Um, Well, we might have to find it after the break, though. (laughs) Anyway, that's, you know, enough for thee, but not for me, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. She yeah, was I, actually, I she was trying to um, break up the big banks by actually, taking their money. Actually, I have this right here. Oh, here it's, you it's, do? It's okay. less than two minutes, so we'll just go ahead and uh, get this on. Thanks, Catherine. Okay, sure. One of the things that Senator Sanders points to, and a lot of your critics point to, is you made three speeches for Goldman Sachs. You were paid $675,000 for three speeches. Was that a mistake? I mean, was that a bad error in judgment? Look, I made speeches to lots of groups. I told them what I thought. I answered questions. But did you have to be paid $675,000? Well, I don't know. Um, that's what they offered. So, um, <laughs> uh, you know, every, every Secretary of State that I know has done that. But you that's know, part- usually once they're office and not running for an office again. Well, I didn't must know. Have known. To be honest, I wasn't, I wasn't committed to running. I didn't. I didn't know whether I would You didn't or not. think you were going to run for president? Again? I, I, yeah, right. I, you know, when I was Secretary of State, several times I said, you know, I, I think I'm done. And, you know, so many people came to me, started talking to me. The circumstances, the concerns I had about the Republicans taking back the White House, because I think they wrecked what we achieved in the 90s with 23 million new jobs and incomes going up for everybody. I did not want to see that happen again. I want to defend President Obama's accomplishments and the progress we've made. I want to go further. So, yeah, I was convinced. But, you know, anybody... So there you go. That's that's, that's the the gist of it. Okay, we're up against a break. Uh, Bobby's on the line. We'll get to you in just a minute. We have two lines open. It's open phones for the next 10 minutes. And then the fabulous John Kappas will be joining us here. He's wearing sequins today. He's extra fabulous. Absolutely. He's glowing. We'll (laughs) we'll be right back. (laughs) Okay, we're back on TalkBack, and uh, real quick, John, uh, you, you did a really good story this morning about the parking meters, so uh, you want to talk about them here real quick? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Let me read some Facebook comments. Okay. Uh, I don't know okay. if we'll be able to get to We have parking meters. They're going to be with us forever. At right. least that was yeah. what the uh, parking commission told yes. me yesterday. So um, let me read some of the comments, and let's get Bobby on the air first. I think we should prioritize. Uh, Kitty says, we love the fun in the morning. Elena says, regarding last night's theatrical debate, did either of the debaters or the moderators mention the Constitution or guns other than the Brady Bill reference? I don't, I don't think know. so. I, I, I didn't watch. So, so. And then Mitchell says, uh, she sounds so shrill. Yes, she certainly does. That's, that's an alliteration. She sounds so shrill. All right. Let's, <laughs> let's get Bobby on. Good morning, Bobby. Hi. What's on so your mind? concerning her fees that she charges for speaking... Um, when she spoke at, I don't know which university it was, doesn't matter. Anyway, she charged them $300,000. And they said, isn't that a little bit much, considering this is taxpayer money? And her response, or her people's response, they represent her, said that's the discounted rate. <laughs> and and, wow. and will also send over her people to in- inspect everything before she shows up and can actually agree to speak there. And she has to have a certain kind of chair. She has to have the proper cushions. And she didn't like the podium. So they had to change the podium at the university's expense. And I guess it was a lot of money. I don't know. Was it all just green M&Ms in the, uh, in the ready room as well, or what? Well, she has to have her things or she's not happy. And she has to have a proper podium that she agrees with, or they have to change it and buy a different one. And she was giving them the discounted rate of 300000 So, I don't know. Maybe she's a little disingenuous, you think? Ah, uh, Okay, Bobby, thanks. I think there's an easy way yeah. to test this theory out. If the money doesn't matter, then she would have given equally as many speeches for the high-dollar um, askers as for the low bidders. Those schools, community services, yeah. places that weren't going to make a dime well, well, off of it, but how, weren't how, going to spend big how, dimes for it. Right? How about some inner-city school that wanted the Secretary of State to come and speak, would she have done that for free? I don't know. And, and who knows? She may have. I don't know. But well, here's I'm the thing. Saying, you know. If Hillary did these speeches for little to no money or for charity, right. 
she should be using that as her her, her response. Absolutely. I, I gave yeah, sure I gave a $600,000 speech for Goldman Sachs, but I also gave $200,000 to my local charity for a volunteer or, effort, you or, know, whatever. Or, yeah, or or forget that. I, I I did a free speech for uh the folks in Harlem or or wherever or whatever it might be. I I I would be touting that. But I guess she didn't. So. Okay, real quick on volunteerism. Yes. I heard so many complaints this past week that I called the parking commission about the parking meters downtown. Right. I have heard from businesses saying they're running out of money, people having problems with them. And basically the story I got is we're we're going we're gonna work to make this work was basically the pitch that yeah, I got from because the parking commission. They've actually sawed off the poles for all the old parking meters. So they're are they gone. just like stubs there or they're, they all they're, they're just the right right even with the sidewalk, they're gone. I was going to tie my bicycle to one of those. Sorry. Uh, you'll have to stand in line to talk with Luke, which happens to be my son's name, which I think is kind of cool. So, <laughs> But they're blaming him. Anyway, uh, we're going to take a break. We'll come back. We'll be visiting with John Kappas and getting your phone calls in the next hour. Welcome, everybody. Hour number two of the Friday edition of Talk Back, brought to you by Bull's Eyewear. They offer some of the lowest prices in town on contact lenses. See Lynette at 2910 South Reserve, Nissan and Hyundai of Missoula under new management, offering rebates, discounts, and 0% financing at a huge selection of inventory on Brooks near Southgate Mall, and by Selway Armory on Stockyard Road. More guns and ammo than anyone at Missoula. The best prices in Montana. They are Montana's premier firearms dealer. All right, we are thrilled and honored to have in the studio the president of Mountain Water, John Kappas. How you doing, sir? Great. It's Thank been a, been, it's been a year since you stood in that spot. It has been. Yeah, it's been yeah. What, what a year. <laughs> what a year. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah, was, we didn't realize it had been that long because we. I guess we've done interviews over the phone at least one since then, right? Yeah. Yeah. Several. Yeah, several. I have with Peter the last <clears throat> couple weeks. But um, I was hoping you could tell our, our listening audience what happened after the last time you were on Talkback. That caused such a delay <laughs> in the time in the amount of time we were able to talk about the issues going on here in Missoula. With yeah, you. yeah, we did it again, folks. <laughs> yeah, so that was uh, before the necessity hearing in March, and so we were out. I, w- I was on Talkback. We had our um, MountainWaterFacts.com page. We had uh, the Missoulian had interviewed our employees. We had ads out, and so we, the the city. Um, went to the court and said we were trying to influence the court and that we would cause problems if there was ever a jury trial. And so instead of um, uh, having any kind of influence to the court or or making it look like we were trying to um, skew a jury in the future, we decided just to pull back our, our talking on the media and just do everything through the court process. So that's why until the uh, <clears throat> jury trial was was canceled in January, we really didn't have much of a media presence. Hmm, interesting. It would have been skewed at that time because uh, Mayor Engen was refusing to come on Talkback, so it was a little one-sided. Um, I wanted to hear, because you know, a lot of people have been watching what's been going on with Mountain Water, and you know, it looks to me like the Liberty sale really... Threw people for a loop. It really threw yeah. people for a loop because, I mean, the the Public Service Commission, right, it wasn't a big fan of Missoula's plan to acquire the water system through eminent domain. But the Liberty Cell really ticked off the Public Service Commission. I was hoping you could kind of explain Mountain Water Company's position on that. Yeah, we can definitely understand the frustration the PSC has. I mean, we were, we were frustrated with the process as well. If you look at, we filed for the application December of 2014. And the first hearing was going to be set for July of 2015. And really, it's, it's a process that in the past, Mountain Water Company hasn't been part of at times. We've, we've acquired without because going you, through that process. You, because you were kind of lower on the a lower tier property of this, what was involved here, right? Yeah, yeah. So the, so the acquire, Liberty was acquiring um, Western Water from Carlisle. Right. And so the process, you know, it usually is a fairly smooth process where you can look and see what the issues are for the new owner coming in. But really the city came in and, and the mayor in September of 2014, when Liberty announced that they were going to um, acquire Western water, he said the city would do anything they could to block it. And so the city involved themselves in the PSE process and all throughout that process continued to 
try to derail it as much as they could. And it, it was a discussion about private versus public ownership. It, it really got tangled in a lot of different issues. It really was outside of Liberty being the acquirer. And so I think the final straw was when the city then, it was scheduled to have a hearing then in January of this year, the PSC, and the city then went to Missoula District Court and, and testified that the PSC didn't have jurisdiction and argued the PSC didn't have jurisdiction. There was a stay put on the PSC process by Missoula District Court, which then showed that the uh, January hearing was going to be delayed. And so Liberty closing the sale, it obviously was a business decision Liberty made after they got the California approval, which was right during because, that week. Because California has its own public service commission, right? Yeah, they have yeah. their public service commission. They actually have a statute that defines how that process will go. And we had we'd gone through the Montana process. We've, we knew what all the different issues were and could see that there wasn't a lot of issues that weren't going to be um, able to be taken care of during rate proceedings. And so it was a decision by Liberty. If I, I think the city really pushed Liberty into having to make a decision. And that decision was either wait in kind of a black hole type process that had been derailed. And so it wasn't the PSC that, that caused the uh, well, derailing. And, and the decision wasn't because the PSC process, we don't like the PSC process. It's that the PSC process didn't have good sideboards for any party if they wanted to take advantage of it. So uh, uh, listening to the PSC talk now, they're acting like, well, we might even revoke the sale. Take it back to before the sale occurred. I, I, you know, I don't know where they're at, but they're, they're pretty upset about the, it. The, the, the phrase they used was unravel. And they might try to unravel the sale. So I guess my question is, do you feel that if you were to go back and do it again, do you think Liberty made the right move? You know, again, as far this is unprecedented um, as relates to the implied jurisdiction of the PSC. Like I said, Mountain Water Company was acquired by Park Water in the early 80s without any review or sanctions. Mountain Water, we have acquired two other water systems um, since then without review of the PSC or any other sanctions. So this implicit jurisdiction, you know, it definitely we understand the PSC likes to have that review process happen. But at the same time, there's, there's no statute or rules that set the guidelines of how that process does or doesn't work. There are just precedents, right? There, there's precedents, but like I said, it's precedents both ways. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's not statutory. Correct. Okay. All right. So we're up against a break. We are also opening up the phone lines. Oh, yeah. If you have a question for John Kappas, give us a call, 721-1290. Doesn't matter who you are. If you happen to be from the PSC or the city, we'll take your call, 721-1290. <laughs> we'll be right back. Okay, we're back on Talkback. 721-1290 is the number. John Kappas, president of Mountain Water, joining us right now. And uh, Susan, you have a question for John. Hi. Yeah, I do. Um, I have not known who to... I'm so glad that there is this show because I'm the program chairman for Five Valleys Pachyderm Club, and I want you to be our speaker for the second Friday in March to talk about mountain water, and my name is Susan Renault. and after the show, would you be our speaker for the second Friday in March? No pressure here, John. <laughs> it's only 27,000 people, isn't it? I really, really want you to be our speaker because mountain water does a wonderful service to the area, and obviously water is essential for literally the life of the Missoula Valley. And hey, uh, Susan. Yeah. I will give you his number if you call in after the show. Okay, you, but we'll then we'll I put you in contact. Qu okay, oh, we'll ask your question quick, okay? I have quick, a okay? question. Wait, I have a question. I said ask right. it quick, that's all. All right, I, wanted, I want to ask him what is his thought about the lawsuit or if he can even comment on what is going on with the city. And I, I'll just hang up and let him talk. Okay. Thanks Thoughts on the lawsuit. Now, there's really two legal proceedings underway, right? Yeah, so as far as the condemnation lawsuit, we have the necessity phase was completed at, at district court. 
We have appealed that decision to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court will hear oral now, arguments. Now, the necessity phase was that long trial that we had, right, with yeah. all the, the famous that, people. That's that, correct. That, it was right. in it was in March was of over, 2015, over, over million, two weeks. Uh, over a million dollars it cost to operate that trial, right? Oh, really? Just the trial? Yeah, just the trial. So anyway, go ahead. Yeah, and so I think up to date total costs on both sides, legal fees, were at about twelve twelve million. I'm sure the Supreme Court oral arguments will be cheaper, right? I, I, you know, it's 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 well, only a couple hours. Well, there's is the really, Supreme Court oral arguments, so and and they're state employees, so they get paid anyway. So. Oh. <laughs> so so we will have so the Supreme Court will have its oral arguments in uh, April. It'll take a couple months for them probably to come out with a decision. If they remand any of that back down to lower courts, and we will continue the necessity phase. At the same time, parallel, we've had the valuation phase. The um, district court has not made a final decision in that valuation phase. Once that final decision is made, then issues relating to that trial will be appealed to the Supreme Court. So that's ca- kind of where we are as far as a standing in, now, in the process. Do you believe? do you believe that no matter what the Montana Supreme Court decides— that it will eventually go to the U.S. Supreme Court or perhaps a, a, like a Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals or, or whatever? It, you know, I, I can't comment on that right now. Okay. We're, okay. It, it would depend on probably rulings of the Montana right. Supreme Court. The reason I ask is because I have friends who uh, have been in the utility industry, okay, and they are, they are telling me that universally that utilities all over the country are watching this situation to see which direction it goes, what, whether, whether you know, uh, privately held utilities are going to have rights or if they could just be willy-nilly taken over by you know, a city if they decide they want their water system. So anyway. Certainly, and that's, that's our, our appeal. Part of our appeal is that we believe the property rights are very important in Montana, and that's what we're arguing is the Montana property rights. But you're absolutely correct. This, this relates to the federal constitution of government taking of private property. Okay. Go Just ahead. want to warn all the listeners, go ahead and take that caller, but um, we will have Ryan Zinke calling in in a few minutes. He wanted, I wanted to get a quick interview with him, and he's busy today, so we're right. going to have to do it live during the show. Right. But it's about drafting women into the military. Yeah, exactly. All right, we'll talk about that in a second, but, but uh, we have Harlan Wells Harlan, on the air. Harlan, good morning. You're on with John Kappas. Go ahead. Morning, John. Uh, gentlemen, how are you today? Excellent. What's up? Well, I have two questions. Um, you know, in city council, I've asked the mayor to comment on the... Uh, legal fees the, um, from Mountain Water and Carlisle side and just what is reasonable. I was hoping you could comment on that. And then the other thing I've been fielding a lot of questions is the uh, developer agreements. I was hoping I could get your side of the story on those. Okay. Thanks, Harlan. Appreciate it. So, Hi, the, Harlan. What I understand about the developer agreements, what, what, <laughs> one of the things about that is um, that the, the several developers who uh, feel that the Mountain Water owes them between 20 and $22 million. Is that correct? Yeah, so we have developer agreements. When the developer puts in infrastructure, they transfer the title of that infrastructure to us, and then we pay them over 40 years for that infrastructure. Um, We believe that in in the valuation process, both the city value um, experts and our experts valued our company based on our net income, and they left the net income, the revenues that will pay those future contracts, with whoever the future owner is. So we believe that um, the valuation clearly shows that the city is responsible for those future payments. Obviously, the city uh, disagreed with that, and so the developers have asked for a, uh, in a different court, and I believe it's Judge Halligan's court, to, for that, for a ruling on whether the city's gonna be responsible for those or Mountain Water Company, and so that's that's left out there still. Not because the city doesn't want to pay. Uh, yeah, the city has said they don't want to pay. We understand the concern for the developers. I mean, they they should be paid for those contracts. We sure. just believe that in the condemnation process, in the valuation phase with the commissioners, it was clear that those revenues we did not get paid for those revenues as part of the valuation of our business, and so those revenues are with the city to um, pay the obligations to those developers. All right, let's um, get th- let's get Kevin on the line. Kevin, uh, you're on Talkback. Go ahead. Hello, this is John. I've heard conflicting reports about what would happen to the employees of Mountain Water should the city take over. Has there been an offer made to the employees of Mountain Water? Okay. Hey, uh, t- tell you what, Kevin, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to put you on hold for just a minute here. 
Because, uh, I, I, and John has told us this is okay to do. <laughs> so sorry about this. Yeah, uh, but we have, uh, well, we have our congressman calling in. Right. Congressman so. Ryan Zinke is joining us on the phone. Ryan, uh, we're trying to be as nimble as we can here because we know your, your time is very limited. Uh, Ryan Zinke, Good thanks. Good morning. Hi. Hey, listen, uh, it's all on the news that now you want to draft our daughters? What's going on here? Well, no, but this is this selective service. Yeah. And this is, this is, we need a discussion on this because, you know, and, the administration pushing you know, women up front on on all all roles, combat roles, and you know my daughter's a Navy guy. My and I told her two things: don't join the Navy and don't marry a Navy SEAL. She did both, <laughs> and, and, and she's an honor man. And and what we need to have is a discussion about mission capability. Everyone has a role to play, and I and I've served uh, in, in in combat roles with women, and and everyone has a role to play. Uh, and there's there's roles and missions for everybody, and then we need a discussion about mission. And when when you serve, you know, it isn't about being a Republican or a Democrat. And and, and I've never asked a person, a man or woman, next to me, who's a Republican or Democrat, because our military belongs to our nation. Uh, but when the administration pushes a on a political lens forward, then then we also need to address if you're, if you're going to make everything equal, then it needs to be equal, and to including the VA. The medical uh, service provided to women is not the same. Uh, you know, women are you know, have challenges as far as injury related. And the Marine Corps study, I think, was was a, was a fair and impartial analysis of it. But you know, when when the administration pushes things along a political line, I think you got to look at what's important to our nation is making sure the troops that go into harm's way, whether they're men or women, have the right equipment, right leadership, right training. To win decisively in the field of battle, and selective service is is part of that. If you're gonna if you're gonna make everything equal, then we need to make everything equal along those lines. I don't think a draft is is likely, uh, and signing up for selective service is not the same thing as drafting. But this is you know, yet again, and when you look at it through a political lens, uh, the, the, you need to have a discussion along all parts. Of, of serving our country. So, are you doing this mostly out of a plea for equality, or out of a better defense of the United States? That you think this would be uh, you know, a better I, I way to have, protect the nation? I'm doing this because I, I think we need a national discussion. Is that when you when you try to jam things in on a political tone or political correctness? Uh, again, with our military, what's important is, is mission capability. It's not equality, per se. It's making sure that when you do put troops in harm's way, you put the right team uh, there. And, and, I, and again, I, I've served with women, and, and he, you, we have a vice CNO who's Admiral Howard. You know, great, uh, and, and I, I, I applaud that. But it's not, it's, not because, it's not pushing affirmative action or women roles. It's looking at us as a team. You know what roles and missions are the are the right way to go, and you look at it at a at a football team. Now the stakes of a football team are not as high as they are in battle, but there's roles and missions for everyone. Everyone shouldn't be a lineman. Uh, there there there's different roles, and again, you know, my daughter is an Navy diver, and she was she was an honor man. I I you know I applaud her desire and effort, but when you're going to put front you know troops in the harm's way, got to make sure they have the right teams. And if you if you, the administration is going to make it, you know, equal opportunity across the board, blind of mission capability, then selective service is part of that role. Well, so is the VA. All right now, now Ryan, it, I, I got to ask you: Do are are there? I'm sure that there are groups going in both directions here. One, I'm sure that there have been women's groups for year for decades. They're saying women need to be part of the draft because we are equal, and that there are other groups saying no, don't draft women because uh, they may end up in the front lines uh, for exactly the reasons you just spoke of. So, uh, are you hearing from these groups? Well, I'm hearing from everybody, and of course, it, it you know it, it made national news because I think it's part of the discussion we as a country have to have. And this is this is my you know part of my responsibility and obligation as a congressman uh, to bring this to light because you know I sit in the House Armed Services Committee as well as uh, uh, Duncan Hunter, and these are important important discussion points, and we have to have the hearing, and we have to have the national dialogue. You know, you know, I do, I do think this election cycle you know, is, you know, an era of political correctness, I think, needs to be over. I think we need to have a, 
discussion, uh, and the discussion needs to be hard-hitting because it affects our nation's security. And so issues like this, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think they're painful. I, I think they're, they're absolutely necessary in the defense of our country yeah. to have this discussion. Our, 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 if we're going to put women in combat roles across the board, then you want to make sure you have the medical on the, on the backside in VA. And if we're going to do this, then select the service as part of that. You got it. All hey, right. Ryan, thanks so much for joining us at the last minute. I know you have a meeting here in just uh, like four minutes, so I'll uh, let you go to that. My pleasure, and thanks for having me on. I, I think it's important for representatives to, to be accessible, and and when when these discussion points come up, and uh, I think we as Montanans uh, should lead the discussion. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Ryan. Likewise. Take care. All right, we're going to take a little break. Back, we take a long break here. We uh, kind of blew through our last break to get uh, Congressman Zinke on, but Kevin, we, we've held you. We're going to get your call on uh, with John Kappas and continue that conversation. We also have uh, lines open at seven two one twelve ninety, and uh, we'll be right back. So That's stay right. with us. <clears throat> Okay, extra long break there because we uh, took a, again, we took up our last break to talk with Congressman Ryan Zinke. But we're back on schedule now. Uh, John Kappas, uh, president of Mount Water Company, and I want to get Kevin back on. Kevin, why don't you repeat your question for those who uh, missed it? Go ahead. Sure. Um, there's been I've heard a lot of conflicting reports about what would happen to the employees of Mountain Water um, if the city it does in fact take over. Has there been any valid offer made to the employees to retain them? Okay, thanks for the call. So, John, what do you think? At this point, there hasn't been anything settled with the uh, employee group as far as what what it would look like if uh, the city does acquire the water system. Um, The city has said that they don't intend to harm the employees, but I would note that they um, just recently filed a motion in front of uh, Judge Townsend saying they do not and will not pay for the attorney fees that the employees have incurred because of this. Um, lawsuit. They said that the employees did not better their position in the uh, necessity phase, and so that there isn't an offer out there. And, and we we believe as an employee group, the offer that started was that the city said they would take the employees at will, which in Montana is illegal. And they also had made comments that they would what, what humanely. Say, I'm sorry. What do you what do you mean at will? What does that mean? So other states have their employment is at will. In Montana, it's just cause. So, so um, termination has to be, you have to terminate for oh, cause. Okay. Gotcha. And so in Montana, the law is different. So in the offer that was made, the formal offer for the condemnation suit, the city said it would be at-will contracts. Um, since then, the city has acknowledged through the process that that wasn't their intent. So the employees definitely bettered their position and had to become involved in this necessity phase. And yet the city, even at this point, is saying, that they will not pay the employees' fees. So, so the employees are worse off already because they have to um, cover those attorney fees if, if the judge would rule in favor of the city. Wow. Um, one of the things that um, we, right before Ryan came on, we had two questions we didn't get to circle back on. I was hoping maybe we could cover those. Uh, one of them was from Harlan, who called in. I think you were able to tackle part of his question, but missed the other part, right? Yeah, Harlan had asked... Um, for me to also comment on the reasonableness of the legal fees, because you know, if if Mountain Water prevails, the city has to pay legal fees. But it also in the statute, if the um, fair market value is greater than what the city originally offered, then they have to pay legal fees. And and the city originally offered fifty million. The fair market value came in at that eighty eight point six number. So either way, the city has to pay uh, the legal fees. And Harlan was asking about the reasonableness because it, the statute does say reasonable legal fees. And I'll just point out that um, the city's up to about 5.1, 5.2 million in, in legal fees. Mountain Water Company at the end of December, that's the number I have at this point, our legal fees were at about 5.4 million. So, so we're in the same range as, as the city. And then on top of that, Carlisle has about Western Water, $1.9 million. So we, we are more than the city, but, but Carlisle did argue from the um, very start that they didn't have to be in this. They should be let out of this because the assets were owned by Mountain Water Company. And they said that it would be costs that, they, that would be incurred if they were forced to stay in this. And, and the... The city argued they should stay in, and so that gives you an idea of what the legal costs have been. Um, when it comes to that valuation, right? City 
came up with kind of a mid-range number between what uh, Mountain Water and what the city had argued, right? It was about, I don't remember exactly. Yeah, it was about mid-range of of the two, uh, both sides' evidence. But but that 88 uh, million, it's it's a far shy shorter than what Liberty ended up paying, right? Well, again, Liberty paid a set amount for the whole all all for three all companies, three, right? and so how that gets allocated out will um, it is it hasn't been allocated out. So, so the value of Mountain Water Company, as set by the condemnation proceeding so far, is eighty eight point six. On top of that, the statute says that there for appreciation since when it was valued in twenty fourteen. As this process continues, there'll be a ten percent interest added on to that. So that's nine nine million per year. So up to you know the end of December of twenty fifteen, that's about another fourteen million that gets added on. So so that was the eighty eight point six is the fair market value that was established, but then there are other costs that get added on to to the, that number. So when that sale happened with Liberty, the mayor kinda triumphed in the newspaper that the that Liberty had made a horrible play. Well, basically, he said Algonquin. Or, sorry, yeah, Algonquin. Well, it's right. the holding company for right, Liberty, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. That they had made a hold, ho- horrible play. They spent way too much for the water company. Um, I was hoping maybe you could give your response to that statement. Well, I think, you know, Liberty and Algonquin have been part of this since September 2014. So so they've, they understand. It hasn't, it hasn't been done in the dark, right? It hasn't been. They haven't been in the dark of the on on what's going on. So they were aware of what the commissioner number was at eighty eight point six. They understand all the other costs, and so so I I would just put that out there that they were well aware of what they were doing, and and so um, did they pay too much? I I think when you add up all the costs that the the community is going to pay, I believe it's going to be well north of a hundred million. So if that's too much. For this liberty to have paid, it's that's going to be where the city has to, what is, the city has to pay. Is Algonquin slash Liberty and, and now down to Mountain Water? Is that a publicly owned company? Does which are, are there shareholders or is it a privately owned, privately owned corporation? So Algonquin is a publicly traded um, company on the Toronto Stock Exchange, and then Toronto, I mean uh, Algonquin, then owns Liberty Utilities, right. which holds the uh, regulated companies in now 11 states sure. throughout the United States. Well, the reason I ask is because uh, with this move that Liberty's, that Algon, or Liberty made, uh, uh, are there shareholders that are saying, wait, why did you do this? In other words, or has there been any response from the, the shareholders about, or if there are shareholders? I, I would have to leave that up to uh, Algonquin to answer that. Okay. Because okay. I, I don't deal I was with just it. curious. You can't be in Canada, too, at the same time. Canada? Eh? Hey? I like it. Um, real quick, you had said something about uh, Liberty not doing things in the dark. A lot of people felt that it was done kind of shadily, the transfer of the sale because I think it happened on Friday but the PSC and the city weren't notified until the next week after the sale had been completed so my understanding is that the sale closed in the evening or afternoon on a Friday and then the PSC and um, community was notified that next Monday morning right Um, which is uh, the next business day which was the next business day um, the P, as far as the PSC, you know, it's, it was a process. That was the way we had to notify the PSC. We put in a, a proper notice of withdrawal and and let them know that the transaction had closed. So so we the PSC was notified as, as fast as a as, as reasonable. So there was no onus. You don't feel to notify the PSC when you started the process to sell because it had to have started during business on Friday, right? Well, the 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 process to start the sale started you know september of 2014 and sure. so so i mean all all parties knew that the transaction was going to occur it's just that the decision was made by liberty and carlisle after they got the california decision to close and that was their decision so maybe maybe they wouldn't have been quite as upset if you had done it on wednesday which you give which would give them thursday and friday to have the hue and cry rather than waiting until monday i i don't know that I can't speculate. I on don't, that. don't know. I'm just saying. I've never heard of a business or any kind of political office that did things on Friday to avoid having to talk to people over the weekend. 
<laughs> Except for everyone. Yeah. Uh, so we're we're, we're going to take a break. Pete and Candy want to visit with you. We have one line open, 721-1290. John Kappas uh, graciously spending a whole hour of his time with us uh, today. Of course, he took a little time out to hear from Ryan Zinke. Uh, and uh, we invite you to join us at 721-1290. Or you can make your comment or ask your question on our Facebook page. Hey, we're back on Talkback. 721-1290 is our number. All three lines are full, so let's get right to the phones. Everybody wants to visit with the president of Mountain Water, John Kappas. Pete, good morning. You're on Talkback. Hi. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Kappas. The question I have is uh, follow-up on the employee side. Do, do they and their legal representative have a chair at the table on these oral arguments before the Supreme Court? Uh, yeah, Pete. The employees did appeal the decision on uh, from the district court that they were not going to be harmed, and so the employees will be part of the, uh, or their attorney will be part of that oral argument. Thank you. Thanks for the call. All right, uh, we have a line open seven two one twelve ninety. Candy, you're on talk back with John Kappas. Go ahead. Yes. Good morning, John. I was just wondering in that article in the Missoulian. You had a breakdown of the, or a cumulative breakdown of the uh, bonding that the taxpayers were going to have to pay off, and that was uh, something like three hundred and twelve million or something like that. If you uh, remember it from the article, I would like uh, you to tell us. Uh, how much it's going to cost us in the long run, okay. and I'll wait. Thank you, Candy. Certainly. So I, I'll be going from memory on this. And one thing I, I would say is that those costs will, won't be from taxpayers. It will be ratepayers those of the water system. Right. The so those those customers will pay that. And what a break the breakdown is is it's the eighty eight point six million of the fair market value. We have the attorney fees on top of that. There's that statutory interest that I talked about, and then there are uh, closing costs and capital costs that bring it up to $124 million roughly. And then on top of that, the city had said that they, they believe that they needed to spend somewhere between 6 to $9 million per year for capital improvements. And so that will be ongoing borrowing that they will have to do over the next 10 years. And so in, my, in the projections we put together, we use the $6 million a year for 10 years. And so what principal and interest on all those costs over the next 30 years will be over $312 million that will leave this community to finance the acquisition and the capital costs. Okay. Now, would that kind of money be spent anyway uh, by the new owners of, uh, of Liberty Utilities would, or Western Waters? Would they, would they have spent that money anyway for, for improvements in, in infrastructure? The, the rate payer won't spend that kind of money um, staying under a regulated utility because, first of all, there isn't the markup, <clears throat> excuse me, of the business to the fair market value like happens in condemnation. So the rate payer has to pay that uptick in uh, fair market value. So that's an increased cost to the rate payer. The other thing is that we do have returns, but our returns are what we put back into the system to do that infrastructure. Okay. So not as much money will leave under private ownership as under the public ownership plan. So the city's case that it can do it for cheaper, you feel, is flawed. Correct. And, and actually, in the necessity phase, um, to, d to do it without a rate increase, the city said their max dollar was about $77 million. And so they've even testified and showed that they will have to have rate increases in order to um, afford a purchase price with a markup greater than than that number. Okay, let's get Dave on the line. Dave, uh, thanks for holding. Uh, you're on with John Kappas. Go ahead. Yes, good morning. It sounds to me like the rate payer is going to pay some more money if the PSC agrees to it. And they're not in a very good mood. What happens if the PSC says uh, no to increases? Well, the, here's, here's the deal. Here's the deal, Dave. Now, I, I'm assuming that uh, if Mountain Water loses and the city takes over, the PSC will have no say at all in what the rate payer will, will pay. Then the PSC basically stops functioning. It no, no, the PSC it. jurisdiction, it loses, it would, the PSC would lose jurisdiction if the city ran the water system. The PSC does not currently have jurisdiction over water systems mm -hmm. run for, by Bozeman Buildings, etc. Right. 
Right. Yeah, the, 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 the only people that you would have to appe- be able to appeal to is the mayor and the city council. Right. But, I mean, if, I'm saying if it, the sale goes through. Right. Uh, right. The new company is going to want a rate increase because of the cost of borrowing all this money. You're talking about Liberty, then? Yeah, Liberty. Okay. And if, if Liberty is owning it, they're going to the PSC to ask for more money from the rate payers. And the PSC is not in a very good mood because of all this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they say no. What is you know what happens here? Well, th- they can't just say no because they are not happy with them, right? There's certain standards there the PSC be, operates. There has under. to be cause. Well, and and Mountain Water Company and Liberty will not increase rates because of the cost of this acquisition. There will be no increase in rates for any premium paid over what our current rates are, because that is set in Montana law. And so that is a significant difference between public um, regu- or, or private regulated company versus a public municipality. By the condemnation, that is increasing the, f- the value of our company, and the taxpayer rate payer has to pay that fair market value under public ownership. Again, under the PSC, any premium does not and will not get passed on to the rate payer. Well, it's kind of hard to believe when they're borrowing a hundred million dollars, but um, we'll see. Well, that's the law. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the call, Dave. All right, uh, let's move along and get as many calls in as we can. Uh, Marilyn, you're on Talk Back with John Kappas. Go ahead. Okay, you kind of answered uh, and commented on a question and a comment that I was going to make about the PSC not having authority over the rates, etc., um, and the service and the operations. After the city owns it, and I think that's very, 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 very important for people to, because government. Well, that was a, that was a big point during yeah. the trial and yeah. during all this discussion is that people at at the bottom uh, needed needed to know, and the mayor uh, seemed to think it was is actually better for the city and the city council to be responsible because they're they're right here, they're local, there you could call your you know, city councilor and complain, that sort of thing, rather than going all the way to public service. Well, and it also came up in the trial because some of the area that Mountain Water Services doesn't actually live in the city. So for those people that aren't in the city, they won't be able to elect or vote against or have any real say uh, unless another department is made to have a hearing for them. Well, property rights is very important to a lot of us out here, and I think that has to definitely be taken under consideration. and. The way government runs things historically is has not been beneficial to taxpayers and property owners. So. Yep. Thanks, yep. Marilyn. Yep. And by the way, uh, if if anybody from the mayor's office is listening, uh, we encourage, we'd love to have Mayor Engen on the show, either in person or on the phone, uh, uh, to give you, we'll give you exactly as much time as we gave Mr. Kappas. Whatever. I mean, that's that's hopefully what the show's about. So. 721-1290. Yeah. And uh, Walt has called that yeah, number, we'll, so let's go to him. Good. Hey, Walt, what's up, man? Hey, I just have a question uh, for John. Hey, how you doing, John? I think you know good, me. Good, thank you. Uh, anyway, uh, what can we do to help? Because I am a uh, user of the water system, and it just uh, I, it makes my stomach just churn. And it makes me sick that all this money's being spent for what? And then, so as a, as a user and a, a person who's concerned about future rate increases, what can we do to help keep the system in place as it is? Go ahead. Yeah. You know, you thanks, know Walt, thanks, I, I think what's important is that um, the community really presses the city the city officials to understand what all the costs are to move forward with this. I think the city's plan has has been very vague up to this point, and I think once there's information out there, then the city city council can make a better decision, and and it's going to take the community to encourage that there be a plan from the city on on how to own and operate this. And and at this point, there's not a very detailed plan. Okay, we're going to take a quick one-minute break. We'll be right back, and Earl will get your call on. We have two lines open, only about eight minutes left in the program. So if you want to uh, get a question answered, give us a call at 721-1290. Hey, we're back on Talk Back. Just a few minutes left in the program, uh, visiting with President of Mountain Water, John Kappas. That's Kappas with an E, in case you're wondering. (laughs) All right, Earl, you're on Talk Back. Hi. Good morning, gentlemen, John, John, and Peter. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Yes, sir. Um, I 
I briefly heard somebody almost bring up the subject, which I feel is the ulterior motive for the city wanting to take over Mountain Water, is that uh, they really want to get their hands on all of the county residents, which are served by Mountain Water. So uh, potential annexations are you talking about? That's right. Okay. And of course, that will give them the opportunity to have a vote in this situation, but that has a significant adverse financial impact on both the county and those county residents, of which I'm sure, if it's speaking for myself, I'm totally opposed to. We get much better service in the county than we would if we were in the city. Now, are you, are you one of these county residents who may be affected by something like that? We are. Okay. So my question is, is in these hearings, who has represented the utility customers that are living in the county and whether or not the courts have heard all sides so that their judgment in the city's interest in taking this over have actually been heard. Okay. Thanks for the call. So uh, has there been specific, is someone specifically uh, that has been able to do that, John? There, there has not a, been a party specific to that. Uh, the Public Service Commission tried to intervene into the condemnation case early on, and the courts denied their the intervention. And part, part of the argument was that uh, a party should represent those county uh, residents. So really the county residents issue has been uh, discussed by Mountain Water Company and the city as pertains to both, both views. But, but the county residents didn't have a, um, a particular party that was representing their interests solely. Okay. Let's get uh, back. We two lines open, by the way. Our number is 721 Mike, you're on Talkback. Hi. Yeah, I, well, this is a question for your guest. Um, if the city gets away with this stunt of on condemnation, it's going to sh- send shockwaves through all private-only utilities because this is going to open a door for everybody to sue on this basis. And personally, I hope you win, but I think I'm right on that, that this is really not the road this country needs to head down. Huh? What's your thoughts on that one? You know, I think you're hitting it. Um, thanks, thanks, Mike. I think you're hitting it right on. As far as a big issue here is private property rights, and and it, it truly does impact utilities across the nation. But it also it, it's the law here in Montana for what gets established as far as precedent in these kind of eminent domain type um, takings. And so it's not just utilities; it's all all property and how the law may may change if the uh, decisions stand in, in lower court. And I would point out that those decisions are just kind of opposite of what was established back in the 80s under this exact same case. So it, it will change um, eminent domain law in Montana compared to what we've seen in the past. You know, I have a question that, that kind of goes, if you will, beyond uh, just Missoula. Uh, the uh, Flathead uh, Compact uh, that has passed uh, and, and there's still, uh, uh, there could be hundreds and hundreds of lawsuits over what's going on there. A, is Mountain Water a part of all that? And B, um, when it comes to uh, uh, ancient water rights, uh, is, is it possible for someone to come in and say, hold on, we, we own the aquifer under Missoula, so basically you're, you're borrowing from us and have been for hundreds, hundreds of years. So is, is that something that's waiting in the wings, no matter who owns the water system? Cer- certainly, there's a lot of uh, considerations and, and concerns relating to that compact. We, we had supported the compact because we felt it took away the volatility and the questions that could be out there if, if there isn't that compact. But, but no matter what happens there, I don't think it, that is going to be an uh, issue, whether we're publicly owned or privately owned. It's, it's a water right issue. And I would just um, add on that you know, from mount, mountain water standpoint, the, the water rights are going to be used for the beneficial purpose of serving this community, and, and we will do whatever we can to protect this community's water rights. Okay, let's get back to the phone. Uh, we've got about uh, two and a half minutes. Bob, quickly, what's your, what's your question? Yeah, John, when we get our city sewer bill, we notice that we pay it to a billing service or through a billing service out of billings. Uh, I understand that the city doesn't have their own billing or customer service department. Can we look forward to the same thing if and when they get the city uh, or water system? Thanks for your call. You know, I guess I'd have to push that 
question over to the city of what their, like I said, what their plan's going to be to operate. We certainly, as long as we stay publicly owned, you know, that's that's the nice thing about Liberty as the new owner. They support local customer call center, local customer service. So we we will continue to have a local um, uh, presence here, and we will continue to serve our customers locally, and, and that will continue as long as we own it. Thank okay. you. How is your water dripping? <laughs> Right. Okay, Mike, real quickly, got about a minute. Go. Yes, uh, I think that um, the government is, the U.S. government is take, trying to take over all the water all over the United States and the world. They're trying to make it um, international waters all open and so that the government can have control of that. They're trying to make every ditch and every uh, pond in America government-owned or controlled for climate control. I don't know what for. Do you think that this is just one small part of that whole effort to take over all the water in the United States? Okay, thanks, Mike. You have, I, one, you have one minute. Yeah, I guess my comment there is the uh, Montana Constitution already has us as Montanans, citizens, owning the water. So this really, we don't see this as much about owning the water as it is about taking over the infrastructure that we use to serve the water to the community. Okay, real quickly, John, we're almost out of time. If folks want to contact your office or, or Mount Water and support or to uh, argue one way or the other, how can they uh, contact you folks? Yeah, you can call down to our, our local number, 721-5570, or you can go out on mountainwaterfacts.com, and we are putting more information out. Um, relating to all these subjects. Thanks for being with us. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And again, uh, Mayor Engen, anybody from the city, we'd love to have you on anytime, uh, give you equal time. So anyway, there you go. What's coming up on Monday, John? Uh, we'll be having open phones. Talk about whatever the heck we want to talk Good about. Good deal. All right. Maybe we'll have the mayor on. That'd be great. Who knows? We'd certainly make, uh, apps. we'd love to have him here. All right. You guys have a great weekend and see ya.